started reading the post back to front and haunted the lion's head. I tracked him down in a newsroom, patient, alert, generous. Then and now, the wise heart of the man, a dead ringer for the soaring voice in those pages. Thank you, Pete. I'm getting crushed here. <laughs> Dan Barry, Mike Lupica, Joanna, Jimmy. Uh, here's my remarks. Uh, the column cut. We used to race and have contests at the old Boston Globe to get Dorothy Schiff's New York Post with Pete Hamill writing it in the column cut always staggered me. I was always reminded every time I'd look at it, and would, I would think, my first thing I would think was Hamill homicide. <laughs> you know, it looked just like a homicide cop's picture. <laughs> but it was Pete Hamill. And I can't overestimate the, the magic that was the newspaper business in those great days of the 70s and early 80s. I, I, I cannot over embroider it, the camaraderie, the fun, the work done, but this man writing about justice, about race, about the war, and in that period of time there was only the war in Vietnam, and bringing it home with those strong, bold sentences and columns with the beginning a middle and an end that you never left wondering, what did he mean? Never ever thought about that. But anyway, I'm sitting over there crossing out almost everything I wrote, <laughs> uh, you know, and I figured, it, well, here's the only thing I can do now is I, I, I gotta work the crowd for a walk, a base on balls, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Maybe I'll get on, and uh, you know, maybe I'll be able to move the runner over to second or third for Sam Roberts to hit it out of the park. Uh, you know, but uh, I'm playing an away game. I guess I, I know where I am in the lineup, surrounded by big league hitters. Uh, and so I'm self-editing as I'm listening to everybody read their old columns. <laughs> if you had told me about that, I could have been up here forever. You, you, you have your, you know, St. Agatha's composition book in your lap. I know, I know what you're doing. <laughs> but I, I, again, I, I, I'm living at the time, you know, in the 60s and 70s, working at the Globe, it was like living in a village, and all of a sudden this man in print brings this electrifying, electrifying feeling of what Manhattan, New York, Brooklyn, all the boroughs was alike. You could, you could feel the steam rising from the grates. You could hear the subways. You could smell the coffee at the various corner coffee shops. You could relate to the people that he wrote about, and it was always some theme that you wanted to identify, filled with empathy and justice, and it was all Pete Hamill. There was no one else. Everybody in that newsroom, my age, Kevin Cullen is here, some someplace from the globe. Everyone my age, we wanted to be Pete Hamill. We wanted to be able to tell stories to people, write about people, because our old editor Tom Winship used to say people love to read about people. And they still do, I believe, if you can find a newspaper. Uh, but anyway, that's who we wanted to be. So I'm thinking now, making notes over there, what am I gonna talk about? So I'm thinking about, what if you just moved to New York? What if Pete Hamill lived next door or upstairs from you? What if you got to know him at that corner coffee shop in your neighborhood where you'd see and speak with him a few days a week? What would you think? I bet you'd think, first of all, hey, this is a hell of a guy. But what a life he has led. He's lived and worked and dreamed in so many different places written about so many different things, 
He's had a life like a great movie. Ne nearly every scene in it fills out the film. Every scene, everything he's ever written about. But forget all the famous stuff. The newspaper columns that read like poetry or fine novels. The fine novels that are electric with life and passion and feeling. And always, they are always about stories with a beginning, a middle, and an end. I bet you'd think he was the kind of guy you'd want as a friend. The kind of guy who instinctively knew if and when you were in trouble and needed some support or some solid advice. And that's when Pete Hamill would be there without invitation. He's the kind of a guy with a big heart and a big brain to match. He's an eye contact guy, a direct guy, a guy familiar with those rough patches and potholes we all bump into along the long road of life. He's not an uptown guy. He is a Brooklyn guy, a guy who could tell you which train to take in order to get out of Williamsburg as fast as possible. <laughs> uh, a guy who knows the Yankees are basically from Westchester. <laughs> a suburban team. They ought to be housed in purchase. No pun intended. Actually, a pun is absolutely intended. <laughs> the Peter Hamill you would meet would be more than just decent. He would be what he is a thoroughbred of a human being, a man without envy in a business filled with envy, with a ton of compassion for the lonely, the lost, those who live on the edge, and sometimes, sometimes, through no fault of their own, slip and fall in between the cracks. He could tell you stories for hours about Sinatra, about Gil Hodges, Campanella, Carl Ferrillo, the rifle with what an arm he had, right field. Did he live in Brooklyn too? No, Ferrillo. We'll get you up here later. <laughs> but he could talk to you about Brooklyn and Belfast, about Los Angeles and lost causes, and about Memphis and shattered dreams about the America he sees each day. He could tell you about the dust and the death that covered him, his city, us, all of us. On that long gone morning when the world changed forever, right out there. Well, that Peter Hamill, which is what my mother always insisted on calling him, even though his name was Pete Hamill in the paper, she would say, did you read Peter today? <laughs> From Galway. That Pete Hamill is a good and decent man, a humble man, in his own way, a man of faith in so many things and in so many people. That Pete Hamill is here tonight. And that, Pete Hamill, is why I, for one, and I think everyone here assembled and everyone here in this hall is so proud and honored to be here for him. I'm Sam Roberts, and I had the good fortune of working with Pete Hamill at the Daily News. Uh, whistleblowers still call me with tips about corruption, but now that I'm writing advance obituaries, people are more likely to slip me their memoirs. <laughs> in that vein, let's pause in silent prayer for what Pete Hamill personifies, the survival of local news in New York, and for the restoration as a result of the innovative journalistic venture called The City. <laughs> 
something we all hope will survive. Paul Sand of the Post once told Pete, if you've got the story, tell it. If you don't have the story, write it. <laughs> We've all got many stories, as you've heard from my colleagues, to tell about Pete. As a young boy, he emerged from his home borough to behold the vertical city of Manhattan that he called Oz, which meant that Brooklyn, still scarred from the great mistake of 1898, <laughs> was more to him like Kansas, like home. And when he moved back to Brooklyn a few years ago, he defied Thomas Wolfe. He proved you can go back home again. He covered New York with a Jesuitical reservation about a city that we may all think we know by now, but one that is perpetually changing. It's unceasingly recycling itself, time and again replenishing the pool of people that we write about with new immigrants. The New Yorker who functions best, Pete once wrote, is the one who understands that you must live with doubt, an underlying skepticism that the utopian city many of us nostalgically cling to never really was. Every year, Pete says that he rereads James Joyce's The Dead, and one passage I think seems particularly relevant to our time. Quote, but we are living in a skeptical, and if I may use the phrase, a thought-tormented age, and sometimes I fear that this new generation educated or hyper-educated as it is, will lack those qualities of humanity, of hospitality, of kindly humor, which belonged to an older day. Still, Pete remained an optimist. He always distinguished between doubt and cynicism. If people say nothing could be done about Brownsville, they lie. Pete wrote, during New York's 1970 slump, if this country would stop its irrational nonsense and get to work, every Brownsville would be gone in five years. Get the hell out of Asia. Stop feeding dictators. Forget about Albany malls, highways. And if Brownsville stays the way it is for another year, someone should go to jail. As New Yorkers, we have been blessed by the exuberance of Pete's tone poems. As journalists, we have been benefited by his boundless generosity, a word you heard many times tonight, his grace, craftsmanship, institutional memory, mentoring, idealism, resiliency. Not too long after 9-11, when Cassandras were predicting the city's decline, Pete bucked the tide. He wrote a novel about immortality. It was called Forever. The city would survive, he predicted, and two constants would endure in the old neighborhood, change and an endless stream of stories. They are flowing still, Pete said, I just hope that somebody is writing them down. Pete, thank you for writing them down, and let's all hope that someone is still writing them down. Thank you, Pete. Please welcome Peggy Noonan. I was, Sam, that was beautiful. I was keen to be here tonight when Dan invited me because I am Pete's great admirer. He inspired me as a writer. He gave me a sense of the possibility of prose. I discovered Pete 
and read him so intensely in the late 1960s and 70s and 80s, and I loved and felt his wryness, his romanticism, his ethnic pugnacity, all of it enriched, I thought, by a seam of lovely bitterness and sudden sweetness. I graduated high school, Pete, when you were rocking in 1968, and I did not go to college in the years just after high school, but went to work instead uh, as a clerk in an insurance company in Newark, and later as a clerk in a small real estate company in Rutherford, New Jersey, where my parents then lived. Uh, at lunch hour each day that year, 1968, I'd have lunch every day at the diner next door to the little place where I worked. And I'd read the newspapers, uh, mostly the tabloids, and chain smoke as one did in those days. And there at the counter, I read the Post and the Daily News and the Village Voice. And I discovered these guys named Murray Kempton and Pete Hamill and Jimmy Breslin and Nat Hentoff uh, and Harriet Van Horn. Remember Harriet Van Horn? I read her all the time. Uh, and they were, all of them were in those days my university. They had voices, nobody used that word then or I don't remember ever hearing it, but they had voices and you didn't know what they were gonna say and they spoke to me and you could take them in with your eye and actually hear them at the same time with your ear. And my favorite was Pete Hamill, not just a great voice uh, for a, a general liberalism I then shared, but more than that, I thought a voice for regular people, but all of them had aspirations. They were noticing America all around them and thinking about it. And he was doing that too, and he was doing it in the newspapers. Uh, we also, Pete, I didn't know this until recently, could have passed each other on the street, for we are both from the old country as you now put it. Uh, Pete worked for a time, I think, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. I was born three blocks from there uh, on Clinton Avenue. We walked by the Navy Yard every day when I was a kid. Uh, my Uncle Johnny and Uncle Patrick worked there in the Navy Yard in the late 1940s and early 50s. Pete's mother had on the wall of their apartment a picture of Franklin D. Roosevelt. My grandmother kept on the window of her apartment, the front street window, a, a faded blue and white cardboard sign that said National Recovery Act, we do our part. I was christened at Sacred Heart Church. Pete, you may have, you must have ambled by there or through there a, a few times. Um, I remembered two things instantly when I heard from Dan, when he invited me here. The first was a column of Pete's that I've been looking for for a week and wasn't able to find. I'm gonna describe it very briefly. I hope I got it right. Uh, it was a column that was so tender and so unusual. He wrote it in about 1967 or 68 or 69. When I read it, I thought, I didn't know you could write about things like that in a newspaper. It was, as I remember it, a Christmas column. It was about Christmas in the city. It was about how people celebrate. It was about going by the big stores. It was about seeing this and seeing that. And then he did this, what seemed a spontaneous aria about a small part of Christmas that was girlfriends of married men and how lonely they were at Christmas. <laughs> and I just thought, you rock, Pete Hamill. What the heck? I mean, but here's the thing that was so sweet. And it was an aria. It was like three paragraphs, and it was, wow. Okay, it had no judgment, no advice, 
no sarcasm, no mockingness, no sociology, thank God. Just the sweetest, worldly, manly compassion. And as I read it, I thought, nobody else writes like this, so broad, so unusual, so original, so human. And it stayed in my head for like 40 years. <laughs> this, those two paragraphs, still in my head. The second was Pete's, I just thought, I will never forget reading it, his great Village Voice report on covering Bobby Kennedy's presidential campaign. The great question in 68, of course, for Democrats was, are you for Gene McCarthy or are you for Bobby? Pete went, he's on the road, he went to the Kennedy for President headquarters in Los Angeles in May of 1968. The campaign is, in retrospect, we can see the campaign was at its height. Uh, it was a month before the big sadness. Kennedy had just won uh, in Nebraska and Indiana. Pete at Kennedy headquarters in LA expected to see elation, he did not. They were just gearing up for the title fight. Pete wrote, quote, the real fight is in California. This is the heart of the new United States. And if Kennedy cannot win convincingly, Hubert Humphrey will be the next president of the United States. Now that paragraph sat there like a dire and terrible warning. Then Pete wrote, away down Wilshire Boulevard in Beverly Hills, McCarthy for president headquarters had seemed like a West Coast version of Walter B. Cook's funeral home. <laughs> One lovely young woman sat behind a table covered with literature and her face was so wasted and forlorn you felt like taking her out to a Laurel and Hardy movie just to give her some perspective. <laughs> but across town, he goes to Kennedy headquarters. He says, Kennedy headquarters was something else. It had a kind of motion and fury to it, played against a background of jerky shabbiness. The walls were painted red, white, and blue and adorned with posters of the candidate. People were dashing everywhere a jumble of hammering typewriters, clattering mimeograph machines, ringing telephones, blasting TV sets, radios tuned to the all news channel. He says, the floor was littered with a compost of cigarette butts, crushed coffee cups, discarded press releases, bald carbon paper, and crusts of Danish. And this is how he painted the staffers there as he walked around and talked to them. He said, the men in Kennedy headquarters were something else. All the younger guys seemed to have been pressed from the same mold at the rent a volunteer with pragmatic compassion works. <laughs> they wore gray suits on the street and in the office hiked their shirt sleeves halfway up the forearm in case a photographer from Look Magazine dropped by. <laughs> he said, they all had horn rim glasses. They all had tight law school mouths. They all smoked thin panatella cigars and they were all pricks. <laughs> I was 18 years old and I thought, wow, Pete Hamill, whoa, nobody else does this. Okay, I read that and I thought, wow, nobody was writing like that. I knew nothing of politics. I was a teenager, but I knew every single word of that description was true. Pete was signaling or intuiting or only observing, but I think signaling and intuiting, uh, the careerism that would come to encrust our politics, a certain artificiality, a growing phoniness. And to read this because it was true, it was exciting. Pete, in an interview, once quoted Ezra Pound, that unfortunate man, to the effect that Literature is news that stays news. Pete, I spent 2016 going to primary states and to headquarters after headquarters, and I can say, honey, your journalism is news that stays news, and they're all still pricks. So, <laughs> thank you, thank you.
just let me add, his work took my breath away. It just gave me a sense of possibility. Pete, I cannot say that it was your intention in life as a very great liberal voice to so move and inspire and impress a writer who went on to write for Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> and as a good Catholic schoolboy, I imagine you know the reward you'll get for this, which is more time in purgatory. God bless you. No notes, nothing. Um, I'm, I'm not a New Yorker. Uh, I'm only 25% Irish. I feel diminished. Um, I'm mainly Norwegian, and you couldn't find anyone of, of more opposite temperament uh, than Norwegians, uh, or more gloomy, dark. But uh, I was born in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And, uh, and I have n no New York experience, but as a young person deciding I wanted to be in the newspaper business, Pete Hamill's words traveled all the way. I grew up on the edge of the Everglades. I re we, read, we, we had two newspapers in our house that we read, the Fort Lauderdale News and the Miami Herald, and somehow Pete's words and his work found his way down there so that when I went to school and I left the uh, University of Florida in 1974 and got my very first newspaper job. Watergate was just happening. It was a very exciting time to go in the business. New, uh, the newspaper I worked for actually made money. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it was incredible. They had these things called bureaus where they would even send reporters <laughs> who didn't have to come to the main newsroom. Um, so I was there and I, this is, by way of introduction to how I, I first, first came to New York. Um, I was working, it was my first year out of school and a phone call came in at my desk and said there was a young reporter in New York City named John Hamill who was working on a story about a, a crooked preacher who had shockingly relocated to Florida. Uh, so this was, Many, many years ago, and already the trend had started. And so uh, Johnny showed up, and I drove him out to the, the, the preacher's church and his, his compound. And we talked, and, and we went out to dinner that night. It took me a very long time to get up the nerve to say to him, are you related to Pete Hamill? And um, he very proudly told me that he was. And I was, it, was, it was like riding around with you know, Mickey Mantle's brother. It was just, I was just smitten. So about a year later, um, I, I, for the first time at age 22, had to come to New York City, and I called John, and, uh, and I said, I, I, this is where I'm staying. I've never been there before. I've barely been out of Florida in my life. I, I, I mean, I literally grew up on the edge of the Everglades, and I, I was coming to this incredible city, and he said, We'll show you around, and, and I don't know if Dennis remembers this, but Dennis and John Hamill introduced me to New York City, and I remember walking at like two in the morning. We may have had an adult beverage or two. We were walking <laughs> down Park Avenue at two in the morning, and I just thought, this is another world. This is a magical, incredible world. And we had even gone to the Lion's Head, and I, and I believe that's where I met you, was at the Lion's Head, and I believe you we're drinking a Coca-Cola, and the rest of us were not. And, uh, <laughs> but it was, the, it was a dreamlike experience for a kid uh, coming from where I came from. And going back to a place that was as different geographically, and in those days, demographically, every other way you can imagine in New York City. The one thing, two things we, we had in common was Florida was already just a, 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 a petri dish for new forms of greed and corruption, which had been perfected up here long, long <laughs> before they got, they got to, to my neck of the woods. And it was the beginning. Uh, and I realized that even though I wasn't working in New York, and eventually I ended up at the Miami Herald, and, but that 
the, I could see the future where we were going, and we were, we were going right down the rat hole. And uh, Florida, as you know, has now become, pro uh, you know, properly famous or infamous for that. And I, I, so I never left, but that was my introduction to the city. And to, it was through the Hamill brothers and through meeting one of my idols. And just a couple of years later, I was at the Miami Herald and I was, the cocaine wars had just broken out in Miami and I was on the city desk. And this is the cocaine wars, not the one Don Johnson invented. These were the, <laughs> this was the real deal. You never, there was no Armani. Uh, there, there, <laughs> There were no Ferraris. There was just guys shooting each other with machine guns on the street. And, uh, and I remember um, a, a dear friend of mine, Bill Montalbano, who was also a reporter and my editor at the time. And uh, this is a true story. He said, uh, and he was on his uh, second marriage. I was still on my first marriage. And, um, and he had, he would st he'd started having lots of children all of a sudden. And, and he said, Listen, I'm in trouble. Uh, Rosie wants a swimming pool. Rosie was his wife. They lived in Coral Gables. He said, Rosie wants a swimming pool. And it's like five grand. And he said, I think we should write a book together. We should write a novel about the cocaine wars. And I and I'd always wanted to write novels. And I knew uh, Pete, uh, Pete's work. And so I, I, I called Pete. And I said, look it, Bill, uh, Bill needs a swimming pool. And I... <clears throat> I, I'd like to give, my, give a shot at this novel thing. What, what would you recommend we do? And he said, well, here's what I would do. I would, I, and I told him what it was about. And, and we had sort of real life bad guys that I had written about in, in, in our investigations at the Herald. And we were going to wisely change their names. And also, we had an idea they weren't. One of the, one of the main characters was a guy named, uh, fondly nicknamed El Loco. And I was, pr I was pretty, he only committed five or six homicides, but I was pretty sure he wasn't a reader, so that <laughs> I thought it was okay to write about him, but we, we insisted on changing his name for the thing. Anyway, and Pete says, why don't you write about five chapters, okay? And um, you send it to me, and I'm going to take it over uh, to my agent, who was Lynn Nesbitt at the time. And so Bill and I sat down, and this is how we wrote. Bill was to chain smoke camels. And we wrote it on typewriters that were like, well, you put two pianos together and two great composers. Well, these were two dissolute, uh, different reporters on either side. And we had to write at his house on, on typewriters when he, and his kids were hanging all over him the whole time. But lucky, with newsroom experience, you can write anywhere. He'd been in combat, it didn't matter. So we wrote five chapters together, pasted it all together. I sent it to Pete, Pete gave it to Lynn, and Lynn handed it to, to one of her protégés, uh, uh, Esther Newberg, who, has, who uh, calls two weeks later and says, um, I, got, I got the manuscript that Pete gave Lynn, I've read it, and I, I've already sold it. <laughs> so so I, I call up Mono Bono, and I said, you're not going to believe this. That, we, the book is sold, and it's the f words out of his mouth were, shit, does that mean we have to write the rest of it, I guess? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I said, uh, if you want Rosie to get her swimming pool, we have to write the rest of it. So Bill, may he rest in peace. But that way we did end up doing three novels together, and 39 years later, I'm, I'm still a client of Esther's. She hasn't fired me yet. Um, but... He, we, whenever we talk about Pete, uh, and whether it's Lupica or Esther or I or any of his friends far and wide, we, we always say he is the most generous person I think I've ever met. And the, his integrity and his wisdom and his in, indignant uh, righteousness about what's wrong and how to fix it. And, Norwegians tend to give up. We gave up on the human race generations ago. <laughs> so we're not natural optimists, and being in the newspaper business doesn't make you. I mean, my family, when they emigrated from, from Norway, cold, desolate Norway, they decided to go to North Dakota. <laughs> I mean, what were they? Th they found the one place that was gloomier than the place they had just left. So, 
so I didn't have enough Irish DNA to, to be able to carry the same spot of spirit and optimism that Pete always had when we spoke and when we could always talk and I could always call him. And no matter what was happening in, in my life or, or anything else, uh, one of my fondest memories of Pete, and it was one of the greatest honors, was after uh, my first marriage ended, I moved down to the Florida Keys. And uh, I, I don't know if you know anything about the demographics of the Florida Keys, but I, I will tell you uh, there are mostly fishing guides and tourists down there. And I, I lived in a little stilt house in a place called Tavernier. And, uh, and I was living alone at the time. And uh, Pete was going out of town on vacation and, uh, somewhere. And he said, listen, can you do me a favor? Uh, would you, can you watch my dog? And I was alone. And he had this magnificent dog, Gabo, who it was named after Gabriel Garcia Marquez. I'm guessing it's the only black Labrador ever named after Gabriel <laughs> Garcia Marquez. Just a, a wild hunch on my part. And, and he said, and I love dogs, and I was alone. All I had, I had some, some uh, snakes in a tank that I had. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to catch snakes. So my only pets were these frickin' snakes. And, and, and they, I tell people why they, they would, people would say, well, you're, all, you're divorced, you're living alone with these snakes. And I said, they said, why? And they said, I said, because they give me unconditional indifference. Um, so, no, it's true. So anyway, Pete says, would you, and here's a chance to have like a real lie. I love dogs. I said, sure, I would take Gobbo. And I wasn't, I did not realize at the time I, I said yes, that Gobbo uh, was the size of Secretariat. <laughs> he was the, the biggest damn dog I've ever seen in my life. A massive, and I had lost two, two Labradors in the divorce. And so um, I had visitation, but it wasn't the same. Bo <laughs> both my dogs put together would not weigh as much as Gobbo. So Pete arrives in my little stilt house in this enormous beast on a, I don't even want to call it a leash, some sort of rope uh, harness, <laughs> pulling him along through the driveway. And up he bounds up the steps. And now I've got Gobbo for a few days. And, and, uh, and so, I mean, but to me, this is Pete Hamill's letting me watch his dog. And it was, I, it was just, I, it was just in, incredible. And so after a couple days, uh, Pete was returning from his trip, but I remember, um, and, and again, this is, I, I don't want to say too much about the demographics about where I was living at the time, but uh, Gabo, uh, with, I had a, a picture window, and Gabo, if I wasn't home, would stand up on all, he would stand up and just put his paws on the, on the sliding door and just stand there and look out at the road. And he was probably close to six feet tall. He was just, he was just enormous. So, there, so one day I was coming home from fishing. I had my boat on the trailer and I was backing in it and a neighbor came over and he said, he said, do you know, I just wanted to t tell you something, do you know there's a black guy living in your house? <laughs> That was my neighborhood. Um, but anyway, I, I want to end on a, li a, a, a little more serious note. Um, I'm going to try to get through this part. Um, on June 28th, a, a guy with a gun walked into a newsroom in uh, Annapolis, Maryland, and he killed five people. And one of the people, one of the journalists who died that day was my little brother. And um, and for two months um, after that, I could not write a word. I couldn't write a postcard, not anything. I couldn't write my column. I couldn't work on my novels. I didn't know if I, I truly didn't know if I was going to be able to write again. And then I thought about what Rob would have wanted. And then I thought what Pete would have done uh, if something like that had happened to him or what he, he would have advised me to do, and he sent me a lovely note, of course. 
And so the, the very first thing that broke the log jam was I, I wrote a column about my brother, but I, I couldn't have done that without having been sort of following Pete into the, the business of being a columnist and knowing what deadlines are and knowing that you have to keep going on. And it probably, in a way, saved me. But I, I want to say thank you for everything and your friendship and your guidance over the years and to keep up the fight no matter what, even when you, you don't think you can go on. And uh, it's, you, you, you are a, a national treasure, not just a New York treasure. Thanks, man. So Barnacle, you thought you had it bad. I got to go after Carl. I'm Charlie Sennett. Um, I worked the New York Daily News. I worked the New York Post. And I worked at the Boston Globe with Michael, Kevin Cullen, who's here. Um, it's tough acts to follow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a new lead on it. I'm going out of order. I'm going to retop the story, Pete. And I'm going to go right to yesterday, right where you'd want me to start a story. I'm going to talk about a beautiful day we had with you and Fukiko walking in Brooklyn, going out to breakfast, uh, having uh, just a beautiful time with you. And we got to see you with the person who is always your true north. So we're all talking about your journey through the world, your New York, your Brooklyn, but your true north. One of the parts of your life I respect the most and admire the most is your marriage to Fukiko. Um, we were having coffee, and I was with my wife, Julie, who's here. And um, we had three of our sons with us who weren't supposed to join us at brunch. But they're, they're big guys. They were hungry. And Pete and Fukiko said, we'll make room, we'll find a bigger table, tell them to come. And there we sat. And a couple things happened. One was, you know, Pete and Fukiko and Julie and I crowded down at the end, and I, and I got to hear the story of how Pete and Fukiko met. And it's a beautiful story. Fukiko was a journalist and an author uh, and a beautiful writer, was interviewing Pete in Tokyo. It's 1984. Pete had just released The Gift, one of his earliest novels in Japanese. And Fukiko had this great assignment to interview Pete Hamill. She was interviewing him, and an earthquake hit. Or as Pete put it, the earth just moved. <laughs> True story. Three years later, they were married, and to this day, I watched them share just an extraordinary love for writing, for the world, and for each other. So that's the new lead. Here's to Fukiko and Pete. But I wanted to talk about a couple things. And I wanted to say this. Look, I'm from Boston. I'm not from New York. You've been hearing a lot of stories. If anyone needs to use the bathroom or you want to hit the bar a little bit early, now's the time, because I'm standing between you and two Hamels. So go now. I'm not going to be insulted. I can handle this. We, we, got, we got through the 86 Mets. We can get through anything. But I do want to tell a story about what it was like to be uh, young once as a reporter and to work alongside Pete. It was 1988, and the New York Post newsroom was like a stage set framed by Manhattan Bridge and the Brooklyn waterfront in the distance. It was the last great newspaper war in New York. We were young reporters then, in our 20s, and we got to work alongside Pete Hamill. We got to watch him head out to write a column. We got to drink a cup of coffee with him in the diner next door and get his ideas on how to think about the day's breaking story, or even more importantly, how to take it forward the day after it broke. Some of us would even be lucky enough to call him a friend and a mentor, although mentor is definitely not the word that he would have used. Some of these lucky souls are here tonight, and some aren't, but wish they could be. 
For all of us, it was like being coached in landing a punch by Customato. It was like learning to paint walls from Diego Rivera. It was like learning rhythm from Gene Krupa. Pete had long stopped drinking. It was 1992, and he was working on a drinking life. I had gone to the Daily News at that time, but Pete was still my editor, my mentor. And during that time, one day a week, we were called from McGuire's or the Lion's Head to Pete's home on Horatio Street in the West Village. We'd be greeted at the door by the big black Labrador named Gabo. <laughs> to get him away from Kriegel, Pete would sometimes throw a bagel in the kitchen and Gabo would go eat it. <laughs> Every time we were warmly welcomed by Fukiko in their home, filled with books, Pete's artwork, black and white photos that chronicled an amazing life. We'd gather to talk about a short story that Pete would assign the week before. The late, great Mike McAlary would never attend this gathering. He called it detention. <laughs> but Pete's brother, Dennis, Mark Kriegel, who's here, Richard Price, Michael Daly, Brad Hamilton, and others were in this circle. We were consumed with caffeine and adrenaline that comes with daily reporting. We were covering front page names like Koch and Gotti and Tyson and Sharpton and Trump and Yousef Hawkins and Linda Fairstein. We were all in search of the wood, as the big block letters of the front page headlines were called. But Pete was pushing us to keep looking past the daily work and to keep reading great writers. The list included Faulkner, Hemingway, Conrad, McPhee, Carver, Dorothy Parker, Alice Walker, and of course, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. This was not exactly a literary crowd, and not one of us would dare call this a reading group. <laughs> but over pizza and Diet Coke, Pete pushed us to focus on dialogue, on characters and plot, to think about what made the writing work. Pete taught us to dare to reach, to be not just reporters, but writers. He pushed us to take on long form magazine pieces and books. He wanted us to explore the bigger canvas beyond the confines of the newspapers. He made our craft a calling. And for us, it was the tabloid newspaper equivalent to Henry V's St. Crispin's Day speech. He told us about Dylan, he told us about Sinatra, he told us about Bobby Kennedy, but there was something more. It wasn't just New York and his Brooklyn that Pete shared. He taught us about Mexico. He taught us about the Korean War and about Havel and about a poet and about how he helped tear down the Berlin Wall and about Ireland and his father's birthplace in Belfast. He told us about Colombia and about his friend Garcia Marquez. He looked out beyond the tabloids in New York to the world in a way that few of the big New York columnists did. Pete opened us up to the world. By 1993, I was uh, reporting on the streets. There was a loud bang in Lower Manhattan. I was with Dennis. We met up down at this scene at the World Trade Center. There's smoke pouring out of the parking garage. <clears throat> And uh, people are coming out with soot on their faces. It was 1993, and no one thought it was terrorism, which I find interesting today. Everyone thought it was a generator explosion. But I was with Dennis, so he, of course, had a uh, Con Edison hat in the trunk of his car. Somehow he came up with it. I don't even remember how the hell he did it. He had like a yellow legal pad, which he handed me, and he said, just keep walking. We went under the police lines. We walked up. We got to see what was going on, and, and it was real clear it was a bombing. And there were cars tumbled down into the parking garage. That story with Dennis was the beginning of a journey for me. I still cover the Middle East. It was straight New York City police reporting. But Pete was encouraging me from the start, 1993, World Trade Center bombing, the first bombing, before we knew about Al-Qaeda. Pete was encouraging me to start to think about it globally, to not shy away from the incredible narrative arc 
of a story I was covering as a police reporter, but that came out of Brooklyn, out of Jersey City, where the suspects lived, to the prisons of Egypt's police state and the madrasas of Pakistan. He wanted me to follow that narrative arc, to think about writing with that kind of scope. So even when I left the New York Daily News in 1994 to join the Boston Globe, I, I arrived there with a promise to become a foreign correspondent to cover the Middle East. Through all that, I was still listening to Pete. He would become the editor of the Post and the New York Daily News, and for me in Boston, he was my editor too. Even long after I had left New York, that stayed true. And to this day, in many ways, I still think of what I do as an assignment for Pete. I work with young journalists now every day, and I'm trying to share with them something they don't get. They don't get to meet Pete Hamill. They don't get to be at a water cooler and have a few minutes in passing as you're going out on a story to ask for some advice, to maybe get a source, to think about where you might take the story. They don't get that. So every day of my life right now and what I do, I'm trying to share with them the same love for the craft the same honest work of listening to people, of hearing their stories, seeing their lives, and sharing them in as honest a way as you possibly can. It's what a lot of us here were lucky enough to learn from Pete. It's why he's our mentor, a word he'd never use. So thanks, Pete. Thanks for being our chieftain, as Malloy put it. Thanks for being our friend. Thanks for being generous. Thanks for giving us hope, and thanks for forcing us to focus on justice. Thanks for sharing this city with us. Thanks for being our mentor. Gracias, hombre. Abrazos fuerte. Carlitos. Uh, Charlie, I'm really glad that um, you mentioned Fukiko when you came up here. We, uh, I was going to do it anyway. I want to tell you all that if it wasn't for this lady, this would have been long ago been a wake instead of a tribute. Pete wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for this lady. So all the jokes about in-laws you want, please. Fukiko, thank you. <clears throat> Um, this one that I'm going to read tonight is called Our Brother Pete, and uh, I'm here to report on the, uh, the last remaining uh, four siblings that you have. Two of us have gone, so um, this is not just from me, it's from, from Johnny, and it's from, from Brian, and from Kathleen, and myself. Uh, what's your name? Dennis. Dennis what? Dennis Hamill. That's what the stranger would usually look up from, that's when the stranger would usually look up from the newspapers at his desk, airline ticket counter, the bank teller's window, or the police sergeant's desk and ask, Hamill? Any relation to Pete? Yeah, brother. Are you the little brother who wrote, he wrote about in a drinking life who asked your mother if God was everywhere, including up that dog's ass? That's, that's me, I'd say. In most quarters of the city, from the towers of privilege to the side streets of working class struggle to the, the neglected back alleys of voiceless poverty to the formica table of our family kitchen, being Pete Hamill's sibling has been a blessing. Pete hates the word sibling, by the way. I ask my sister Kathleen, herself a wonderful writer, quote, in my mid-twenties, I was hired by editor Chuck Odie as the proofreader for the home reporter in Sunset News, Kathleen writes, of a Brooklyn Weekly. I had always found writing an easy task, but I'd never written for an actual newspaper. After yakking away with Chuck one day <clears throat> in the late 1960s about a head shop that had opened on Bartell Pritchard Square, he startled me by saying, Go interview the owner, write, down, write about it for the paper. I'll send a photographer with you. Go, now. Wow, I said, a real assignment. 
That afternoon, I interviewed the owner and thoroughly immersed myself in the hippie clothes, records, rolling papers, and pot paraphernalia, incest, and psychedelic posters sold in the head shop. This was hippie central for all the young guys and gals that grooved together nightly across the street on Prospect Park's hippie hill. I was one of them. <clears throat> I finished my first piece that night, Kathleen said, but it... I hadn't a clue if it was any good. Naturally, I called my brother Pete and asked for his help. That's what we did in our family. Pete was the big brother, smart, generous, kind, and the only one who always told us that we were better than we thought we were. Pete read my piece and told me it was great. However, he carefully explained how to tighten it up and hammered at me. Keep it tight and crisp. End with a concrete noun. I still have a yellowed copy of, of that first piece, and it, and it evokes in me a warm memory of my brother guiding me and sharing his brilliance. This was, and still is, my beloved big brother Pete. It was the same for me as it was for Kathleen. There was Pete Hamill, the celebrated writer, who wrote with genuine compassion about perfect strangers, and big brother Pete of bottomless love, and generosity who taught life lessons by example. Pete had no big brother himself, but he had the great good luck to be guided by our mother, Annie Devlin, Annie Devlin's ironclad rule. There is no bigotry allowed in this house, she'd say. And our father, Billy Hamill's even simpler rule for life, take shit from nobody. Pete has spent a lifetime following those two golden rules, refusing to tolerate intolerance and speaking fearless and often biting truth to power. He has never sold an inch of his soul for the king's shilling. My brother Brian learned that life lesson from Pete as a kid. In the summer of 1949, my older brother Pete lived on East 9th Street, just off 2nd Avenue, writes Brian. There was an associated grocery store on the northeast corner, the neighborhood was a mix of immigrants, and most of the shops reflected the roots of those who lived and worked there. It was different than the neighborhood where I grew up in Brooklyn, which was mostly Irish and Italian. The East Village had Irish and Italians and many Polish Jews, Puerto Ricans, Russians, Ukraini Ukrainians, and beatniks. It had diversity. I dug it. I did chores for Pete two days a week, taking care of laundry and dry cleaning, shopping for food, Pete was always very busy, never a loafer. He was then working as the art director for a Greek magazine called Atlantis. He was a gifted artist, having taken art classes at Pratt, and Pratt Institute in Mexico City on the GI Bill, Mexico City College on the GI Bill, after his childhood years designing and writing his own set of comic books with original drawings, descriptions, and dialogue for each character. I had a set of keys to Pete's apartment, and he would leave detailed lists of the chores he needed me to do while he worked, Brian writes. He would paperclip the cash to the note. On one particular day, the cash, um, the cash amounted to $40, two tens and one twenty, and they were firmly gripped in my hand as I headed out. On my way to the first shop, while deeply immersed in the awesome people watching visuals up and down 2nd Avenue, I somehow lost one of the tens. I frantically retraced my steps to no avail. <clears throat> the tenski was a goner. I felt terrible. I had never lost that much dough. And when I got back to Pete's pad, I let loose with some private tears. Instead of my usual routine after finishing the chores by jumping back on the subway, to hang with my friends in Brooklyn, I decided to wait for Pete to get back from work and tell him of the lost 10 spot. And I waited and waited. Finally, after a few hours, I heard Pete, Pete's key in the, in the lock. I opened the door and Pete said, oh, Brian, you're still here. I thought you'd be back in Brooklyn hours ago. How are you? I burst into tears. Through my sobs, I told Pete about losing the $10. He hugged me and said, Please, do not worry about it. It's not a big deal. He repeated those words several times. It's not a big deal. He then removed another $10 bill from his beat-up wallet and tore it into little pieces. Then he threw them in the air while hysterically laughing as the pieces floated down. <laughs> then Pete said something that has stayed with me my whole life. Money is just a convenience. Do not attach too much importance to it. 
Those words have never left my brain, just as Pete has never left my heart. Uh, obviously, Pete was still drinking if he was tearing up tens in 1959. <laughs> <clears throat> did being Pete Hamill's kid brother help me break into newspapers? Of course it did. But Pete didn't, didn't report my stories for me. <clears throat> but he'd read my early drafts and return them with more red ink than a Trump casino. <laughs> when I sought a daily newspaper column on my own, I made the professional decision to leave town for Los Angeles and then Boston for a couple of years to escape Pete's shadow. But there was never a single day when being Pete Hamill's kid brother has not been one of my life's greatest gifts. Speaking of gift, gifts, on every Christmas and birthday, Pete gave each of us, each of his siblings, gift-wrapped books, handheld time machines that transported us from the Brooklyn tenement and the Staten Island housing project to different centuries, countries, and lost civilizations. He bought me the Hardy Boys and later the Old Man in the Sea when I was going away to a Fresh Air Fun summer camp. When my mother wasn't looking, he slipped me a copy of Ed McBain's The Mugger. When he learned I loved Bob Dylan, he bought me the collected works of Francois Villon, a 14th century vagabond poet who'd influenced Dylan. <clears throat> when he noticed my interest in psychedelic art, he bought me a coffee table book on Hieronymus Bosch. <clears throat> whom I was convinced was a better, who had a better weed connection 500 years ago. <laughs>